Hello, my name is Diego Vela. I'm a medical oncologist with the Lymphoma Tumor Group at the BC Cancer Agency, and I am here at ASH 2015, uh, hoping to review a few very important points about safety uh, of uh, novel agents for CLL. As you know, there have been many new small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, for relapse refractory non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, particularly the use of ibrutinib and CLL. As we gain more experience with these medications, it is important to pay close attention to the longer follow-up of the arms of randomized clinical trials, as well as single agent studies of ibrutinib and related molecules. Since patients can remain on ibrutinib for extended periods of time, it is therefore important to be aware that some side effects may emerge with the passage of time and that these may not be necessarily captured in the original publications. Ibrutinib was approved by Health Canada and the FDA based on the Resonate trial, which was a phase three trial of 391 patients treated uh, with ibrutinib versus ofatumumab in the relapse refractory CLL setting. There is a second randomized clinical trial looking at patients with relapse refractory CLL called the Helios trial. This has not been published, but it was presented at ASCO earlier this year. Several oral and poster presentations at ASH this year will look specifically at some of these emerging adverse events on novel therapies, as well as health-related quality of life. When I reviewed these abstracts, I came across three topics or three themes. Uh, the management of atrial fibrillation, the management and the recognition of bleeding events while in ibrutinib, as well as some interesting data on quality of life. I will review each of these topics independently. I will begin with atrial fibrillation. It is difficult to know to what extent ibrutinib is related with atrial fibrillation, given that many patients with CLL have cardiac risk factors or pre-existing atrial fibrillation to begin with. However, in the Resonate trial, about 3% of patients in the ibrutinib arm experience grade 3 atrial fibrillation. There is a poster at ASH this year which looks at atrial fibrillation in the Helios trial. This is a larger cohort than the Resonate trial with 578 patients. In the Helios trial, about 7.3% of patients randomized to the ibrutinib arm experienced some, kind, some degree of atrial fibrillation compared to only 2.3 randomized to placebo. Now when you look specifically at grade three atrial fibrillation, the incidence of this complication was approximately 3%. Again, very similar to what was seen in the Resonate trial. The median time to atrial fibrillation was about three months, but with a broad range. And it's important to keep this in mind because the median time on ibrutinib therapy in this trial was approximately 15 months. About a third of patients either held or discontinued the ibrutinib, but the majority of them were able to resume it, and with adequate management, the majority of patients on the study were able to continue their treatment without any significant complications. There is a smaller investigator-initiated trial uh, of 86 patients from the National Cancer Institute, also presented at ASH this year, looking at patients treated with single-agent ibrutinib. Nine of 14 patients with atrial fibrillation developed this complication during the course of therapy for an approximate incidence of 10%. Even though this seems higher than what I previously uh, reported, this did occur with longer follow-up and when authors looked at the incidence of atrial fibrillation at the 17-month mark, it was in line with the other randomized phase 3 trials. Of these patients, three discontinued because of adverse events uh, requiring admission and intravenous, medic and intravenous treatment for the atrial fibrillation, but fortunately in this particular cohort, all patients were able to resume ibrutinib after adequate management of atrial fibrillation without any further complications. So perhaps there's a higher incidence of atrial fibrillation because we're looking for it. Or perhaps there truly is an effect of ibrutinib on the myocardium leading to atrial fibrillation. This then begs the question, what is the true incidence of atrial fibrillation in patients with CLL? There is a third poster in which the Mayo Clinic looked at a database of 2,444 patients with CLL and looked for cardiac risk factors in atrial fibrillation through chart review and ICD-9 codes. In this particular cohort, they found that the prevalence of atrial fibrillation was approximately 6%, but the incidence of atrial fibrillation was also 6%. In the patients with new atrial fibrillation, they found an approximate 1% per year incidence of atrial fibrillation with a linear risk. In their study, they suggest that atrial fibrillation is largely driven by age and other comorbidities. Taken all together, these studies suggest that there is an association between ibrutinib and atrial fibrillation, 
although it is very difficult to say that there is causality. That being said, it's an important complication to, to be aware of, but fortunately the majority of patients are able to continue brutinib uh, when they have adequate management for atrial fibrillation. The second theme I would like to discuss is bleeding complications. In the Helios trial, there was a doubling of the bleeding events in patients randomized to abrutinib with approximately a 30% incidence of bleeding events of any grade, although the majority of them were grade one or two, which is basically spontaneous bleeding or bruising without any significant complications. However, the incidence of grade three or four bleeding was approximately 2% with no difference between arms. This is interesting because approximately 40% of the patients in the Helios trial were receiving some form of anticoagulant or antiplatelet agent, many of these for underlying atrial fibrillation or cardiac disease. In the Helios trial, the incidence of grade three, four thrombocytopenia was approximately 15%, again, similar between both arms, which makes one, which makes one wonder whether the bleeding events are related to a quantitative problem versus a qualitative problem. It turns out that BTK is expressed in platelets. The Austrians uh, performed a small study of 24 patients with CLL on ibrutinib and evaluated ristocetin-induced platelet aggregation. In their study, they included 24 patients with CLL receiving ibrutinib. They measured their ristocetin-induced platelet aggregation before and during the treatment. They found that patients with a bleeding event had the lowest levels of ristocetin-induced platelet aggregation. This suggests that qualitative assessment of von Willebrand factor dependent platelet function may serve as a method of predicting bleeding events or monitoring for bleeding events in a certain subgroup of patients, such as those on anticoagulants or those who may require elective surgery. The third and final topic I would like to review is health-related quality of life. When we did the Helios trial, patients had to complete a number of health uh, quality of life related questionnaires throughout the course of treatment. These have now been compiled in a poster format and not surprisingly show that as patients begin BR, uh, their quality of life improves. This is simply because their disease comes under control. The quality of life curves show that after approximately four months of therapy, there is a leveling off of quality of life. But if you look closely at those curves, there's actually a slight improvement in quality of life over time. In summary, these data that ibrutinib can be given to patients for long periods of time, and that some of these emerging toxicities, although relatively uncommon, can be managed and do not necessarily lead to treatment interruption for these patients. Thank you very much.